gang members. The dangerous criminals with the craving for drugs, theft, violence, and the inability to function within a society. Or at least that's what we've been told. I'm Anthony Padilla, and I'm gonna find out from ex-gang members themselves, how do gangs actually operate from the inside? How do they lure you in and initiate you? And what happens if you even attempt to leave? Hello, Skip. Man, how you doing? Baby in. Yeah, what's up, man? How you doing? By the way, this episode is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Visit betterhelp.com slash Padilla because sometimes existing is exhausting. I feel like everyone has their own definition of what the word gang means to them. What does it mean to you? Well, it all depends, right? Yeah. Uh, gang, uh, on on who, who is saying it. Somehow, some way, some of us make the choice to partake in that particular gang. And it all comes down from not having either a resource or not having the proper guidance mm. or maybe just not having hope at all. But all you were looking for was a sense of community? A sense of community, a sense of refuge, and someone who can understand me. And did you find some solace in spending time with a group of others? Well, we all went through some of the similar situations. Yeah. Um, lack of fathers in the home, mothers working two jobs. We find ourselves outside till eight, nine o'clock at night. And then we live down the street or around the corner from each other mm -hmm. or even next door. It, it becomes a camaraderie. You know, most people would want to emulate and say, oh, I'm a Capone or I'm crazy killer. I'm the, and this is a, a alter ego like Superman and Batman. I don't want to be Theodore Rockenheimer. I want to be Tiny Killer. I get to choose who I want to be in this alter ego lifestyle. At the time, me growing up in the 80s, it uh, was during the decade of violence and the crack cocaine epidemic. And then having to come from both parent, immigrant parents uh, with already obstacles in place. For example, uh, my father was a loving father, mm. but eventually due to his own uh, obstacles per se, as an immigrant, mm. he became a drug dealer. Just uh, strictly to, to, to make, to get I, to make yeah, ends meet. I would say he became a drug dealer to provide for his family at that time, but not knowing that it came with a price. And eventually my father would get taken away and go to prison. And because it becomes so heavy, you go out to the street. You and your friends didn't consider yourself, oh, we're part of a gang. You know, when we grow up, we want to be part of a gang. It wasn't, it wasn't any of that. I want to be a bus driver. Mm. I want to get a big old steering wheel and drive the bus down the street and turn corners and stuff like that. <laughs> Those steering wheels are <laughs> insane. Right, I never, want to, I never want to be a gang member. I don't know that any parent has a child and says, oh, look at my gang member. Or any, any child grows up and says, yeah, I can't wait to be a gang member. What happens is society tells us these are gang members, they're suspects, they're terrorists, they're hoodlums, mm. they're thugs. Um, we have to put them away. All I wanted to do was graffiti art, art in general. That was my outlet, my escape. And so then I was constantly getting bullied. I would get jumped. Where are you from? I don't bang. I'm a tagger. Bah, bah. Get out of here, little punk. Take my bikes, take my chains. So I went through a lot of that as growing up as a young man. And then after a while, you start to get fed up. And then you're just like, then might as well. I was 14 and I think for me it felt right at the moment because of the fact that I didn't have my father to guide me. I didn't have that refuge, that, that safe space or that place of safety. The moment that I, be, I became part of something, yeah, it felt like, okay, and now the resources have arrived. So did you eventually kind of uh, operate like a gang at all or was it strictly just individual trying to survive, just so happy to be safer with the group? We never had any organizational structure. Mm. Everyone has their own influence and no one person can say, hey, we're not doing that anymore. This is what we're gonna do. You know, like gangs don't always say, hey, what's up, man, how you doing? Uh, here, here's a manual, check out our rules, yeah, 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 uh, our yeah. bylaws. The do's, the don'ts. Uh, yeah, you know, let me know if there's anything there we would like to rearrange or adapt. <laughs> just, just get back to me. Yeah, they just take you as you are making that commitment. And of course they initiate you in as a symbol of you're willing to take whatever it takes to be part of this. I would say it was the worst mistake I ever made because of all the turmoil, all the hurt that it brought and instilled in my family. You know, getting shot at, uh, taking risks, you know, going into enemy territory, putting up the neighborhood, writing on the walls. In that moment, bullets flying. 
You can really hear bullets flying. Yeah, around. you can hear them or hitting the vehicles. And then, uh, and just grasping, hoping that, that you're okay. Uh, there was a time when I was riding on the wall and my, my, my homies, you would say, they told me, don't go over there, fool. And I was like, I don't care. You know, thinking I'm the toughest guy in the block. Went over. And then I hear, what's up, fool? And I look, and the enemy's standing right across from me. Keep riding, punk. I said, well, I'm going to keep riding, fool. It wasn't that nice for saying words. <laughs> there's some, there's uh, some, some choice some, words. There's some choice words in uh. there. And then I stood my ground, and I kept riding. And then you hear, blah, blah. And then the same, the bullet hit the wall, and the stucco from the wall hit my eye. I dropped to my knees, and I crawled to run across the housing project. Da, 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 da. And when I got to the housing project, whew, no instead bullet. of being afraid, I felt a rush. Oh, shit. And I want more. That's the insanity that comes from within this gang subculture is similar to drug addiction. A lot of the times people tell us, you're gonna end up dead, you're gonna get shot, you're gonna end up in prison. Then I say, I don't care, give me one of those. I ain't got nothing to look forward to anyway. You almost welcomed it because it was- Absolutely, and that's why when we talk to kids or youth and you say, you know what's gonna happen when you go to prison? Nine times out of 10, they know. You're not scaring me straight. Right. I'm miserable. Right. You're actually giving me some beautiful options here. Was that hard for you to, to learn how to talk about your emotions? In those day and age, I didn't. What I did is I showed up every day. Let me share with you what suicidal is. I was suicidal. Not going to slip my wrist. I'm not going to shoot myself. I'm going to be 120 pounds, and I'm going to go outside every day in red. And it's not because I'm a great fighter. I know Kung Fu or nothing like that. It's because I didn't care. It's because kill me. I don't care. So do you see the suicidal is not that I'm going to hurt myself. I'm going to wait for law enforcement or a crip or someone else. Come on, I'll fight you. I'll, I'll do whatever because I don't care about dying. So that way I never have to address any of my fears, any of my insecurities, any of the things that uh, any of the unresolved and vicarious trauma that I suffered. I don't have to deal with any of that. Mm -hmm. I just go out and deal with this moment each and every day. Can you talk about the, you know, the kind of suppressed emotions that you and your friends who found themselves part of what people labeled gangs were, were feeling? Did you have any kind of communication with your, your peers about that kind of thing? About So Anthony, let me stop you right here. <laughs> I'm me, assuming I know the imagine, answer. Imagine me going to the park and looking at the big homie. Okay. I go to big homie and say, hey man, do you get depressed <laughs> and wonder why your dad isn't here? And what is Shermhead gonna do? He's gonna give me some Sherm and I'm gonna be running naked on the freeway within an hour. You know, he's gonna get me high. He's gonna teach me how to handle or cope with life the way mm. he copes with life. So if I go to Big Killer and mm. say, hey, Big Killer, man, I've been sitting here thinking, man, and life is bad and this and that, Big Killer gonna give me a gun and say, hey, man, go with the little homie, man, you'll go shoot something. I want to talk about the power of change and how someone can live a lifestyle like the one you lived and completely change and be the type of person that you are now. So I learned about instincts and learned behavior. So my learned behavior was my downfall. The things I learned, somebody hits me, hit them back. That's not instinctive. I was taught that. I had to work on me before I could help anybody else. I had to identify what are my triggers? What are some of the things that set me off? Um, what I remember hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, and touching as a child. So once I started working on me, and there was a guy, um, Russell Freeman, he has a grief recovery class. So me and a whole bunch of Rolling 40 Crips went to his class, and we had notebook and paper, and we said, we're gonna learn from you how to heal our communities. He said, well, put the paper down. And he said, write your obituary. Like, what? So we're writing the obituary, and I wrote a nice obituary about me and where I grew up, and I went to this school and that. He said, you left out the main part. And I said, what's the main part? He said, who do you leave to cherish your memory? Who do you leave to mourn you? Next thing I know, one of my friends over here crying, got tattoos all over his face. He's sitting there crying, wiping the tears. I'm sitting there crying. We all sitting here crying like, man, F you, Russell. <laughs> why, 
<laughs> but what he showed us was that we hadn't worked on us. We want to save our communities, but we still hadn't healed because my idea was I was going to save my neighborhood. I was going to be the Father Greg Boyle. I was going to get everybody a job. So now you're not shooting at these guys or shooting at their kids. And I thought I was going to be this, you know, superhero. Mm. But I was still messed up inside. What's going on is we have a lot of individuals who are unhealed. Mm -hmm. And they're going starting families. They're going to work every day. And we say, man, why they snap? And they snap because they didn't have that emotionally safe outlet to talk. Would you say that the first step for most of these people was just having that safe space to talk about their emotions? Definitely. Especially individuals coming home from prison. Uh -huh. There's a guy who went to prison at 17, Latino guy, went to prison at 17. He did uh, about 17 years. So he comes home 35, 36 years old. And um, the question was asked like, hey, man, you seem to be uh, kind of racist. And he says, yes, I was raised like that in prison. He said, please forgive me. I'm going to work on it. He said, but I was taught not to deal with you, not to talk to you, not to like you. He says, I have to overcome that. It has nothing to do with you. Let me overcome this over mm -hmm. my time period. And I mean, that's as real as you can get. At right. that point, I could say, man, I totally understand, brother. Take your time. Get, ma get back with me when you're healthy. That's a scary thing to say because there are so many people that say, once you were one way, you are that way forever, and I will only ever see you as that, as your worst right. self. Right. Have you dealt with that at all yourself, where people hear oh, that you're definitely. part of a gang and then they treat you like a gang member? Oh, definitely, definitely. I've had a... A famous celebrity, I ain't gonna say his name, treat me like, uh, be, asked me to hold his dog. When I was driving a tow truck, I was showing him a car, a Mercedes Benz, and saying, this is what we're doing here, the company I work for, and um, I would like to tell He said, are you one of the owners? I said, no. He said, would you hold my dog for me? And he gave me the dog, and he walked over and started talking to the other people. So I'm sitting there with the dog, like, what am I doing holding this dog? And then I, when I realized what he was doing, I was like, oh, no, nah, man, I'll chunk your dog out on sunset. You know, your dog will be uh, roadkill, man. You better come get your dog. That's before I knew how to deal with my anger. Right. What do you think the, the emotions that you were running away from were? After doing my internal work, after working on myself. And Which is a lot harder than it sounds. Oh, so. absolutely. <laughs> it took me 15 years before I can realize I had a drug mm -hmm. problem or a gang problem or any of that. I come to learn that I was, uh, I was running from abuse, neglect, abandonment. And those are the three things and the lack of father in my life. For my father is a man that I loved and admired and looked up to and wanted to be just like. And he infused me with love. I was his king because he was a great man. It's just drugs took him from me. And also systemic oppression, suppression, no resources, immigrant. And there's various ways that folks trade gangs. But one thing I do know and what I've come to learn is that behind every gang member, there is a human being. And then that human being is only trying to fill the void that has been lacking in their lives. The minute they recognize their importance, their worth, and who can they really become, transformation begins to happen. Was there a moment when you said, I need out? You know, when I left, I got jumped out, as you're supposed to. Jumped out. Jumped out, meaning jumped out of the gang. But with just one final beating. And who knows if you survived that last final beating. But thank God that it played out the way it needed to play out. Oh, many times, many times I will contemplate. Not in the beginning, but as you get in a little further in, mm -hmm. you see more and more things start happening. Close calls, mm -hmm. near-death experiences. I lost my friend, one of my friends. Uh, we will call him Sorrel. Uh, he was a tagger. It sounds almost like you had a spiritual awakening. Was there oh, a moment? Shit. So the spiritual awakening I had, and I talk a lot about, my mother was so upset that I was doing drugs. And she told me, if I come home and you're doing drugs, I'm going to call the police. And she would, because she's done it many times before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so I knew she would. Yeah, she wasn't yeah. playing. In that moment, I was so m m whacked out, mess. And I remember her coming from home and she kicks the door open or opens the door. Where's Fabian? Fabian, Fabian, Fabian. She's looking for me in every, in every room of the home and I'm in the attic, blown out of my mind. And eventually I had to get out that attic knowing that my mom was home. So I bust a hole through the dry one and I land in the living room. For my mom could just say, hijo de tu, all these beautiful names in Spanish. Uh. She picks up the phone as I knew she would mm -hmm. and I looked at my wife, my children, and my mom. 
And I knew I really did it this time. And so as she's yelling and calling and screaming at the police, all that, I'm looking at them with this, this trying to project the ounce of love, even if it was a drop, or letting them know, like, I do care, look. And I ran out of my mother's house, and I ran through Hollenbeck Junior High and Roosevelt High School in Boyle Heights, made my way to the 5 South Freeway. I jumped into the pond knowing the helicopter was getting closer, the sirens were sounding louder, and now I'm playing Rambo, all smoked out, because I said I'd rather be dead than to go to prison. And I'd be a fool if I go to prison, because that's not a place for me. I climb up the, the bridge, and as I climb up the bridge of the freeway, I'm walking on the edge of the freeway wall. It's not leading me anywhere, so I hang by the wall. I let go, and when I land, the wall so high up, that the knees hit under my jaw. Mm. I bit my tongue ripped open, practically bit it off, full of blood, full of water, smoked out the game, maybe weighing about 105 pounds, maybe, if I'm lucky. And I'm walking on the side of the road, knowing that I was dead, pretty much. Inside, I was robbed. I had, if I'm lucky, if I even had a spirit at the time. And I'm walking on the side of the freeway, the voices come back. Kill yourself. Kill yourself. And inside here, it sounded as if they were yelling or screaming from the universe. And I'm like, oh my, like it was so loud, terrifying, taunting and haunting that I shut my ears. I looked to the sky and I disrespected God. F you, God. And I ran across the freeway. And I'm in the first lane, the second lane, running, ain't no turning back, full speed, trying to get to the center divider. And as I'm getting to the center divider, I see a turquoise truck, Suburban. I remember it very well. It's coming full speed. It's getting closer. It's not stopping. I clench my fist. I twist my body. And my last cry for help was, my kids. Something spiritual took place. I felt as if a gust of wind. Boom, I felt the impact. Hit my chest so hard on the center divider, almost broke my collarbone. And then I hear, <laughs> the truck did not hit. I sit on the center divider, I look towards the sky. I saw the sun rays dancing beautifully. And I received the feelings of peace, joy, happiness, and serenity. The feelings that can only come from something that much greater, or maybe, it was the feelings that my grandmother instilled in me? Or was it my dad that came to help and push me? But whatever it was, I'm having this beautiful communication and contact with my higher power. That day I learned and understood that every son must return to his father. That day I did. And the thought of my children was the purpose. Why oh, you get to live. In that moment, and it's funny because I'm over here in a trance zzz, with my higher power. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> yeah. And you hear, get off the freeway. <laughs> God damn, homie. Like, I, I was got, having a moment, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Five so, more seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and then sure enough, it's highway patrol, guns drawn, and all right, man, you got me, bro. Because all that. And then they am trying to rip over and like, get over here. And I was like, all right, all right, get out the same way. I flipped them off. Oh, yeah. And I ran. <laughs> they already had stopped the other side of the road. So I run down the freeway, and I go back down to the projects where I grew up. I pick up the phone, and I call one of the two women in my life who still to this day have not betrayed me and probably never will. Ama, ¿dónde andas, hijo? Tu pinche perra, vale, te pesto, te 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 pesto, te 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 was the touch of God that I discovered in the freeway incident. Was it that moment that really solidified the change within you? I believe so. I do believe that in that suicide attempt, I realized that, that it's bigger than me, you know, and uh, there is something beyond or greater than, and 
And you just hope to walk alongside people, man, long enough for them to hopefully mm-hmm. tap into what I have discovered myself mm-hmm. in their own way. Mm-hmm. That's how I move. So you eventually left this lifestyle. And I can't go without thanking BetterHelp for sponsoring this episode. Therapy has really helped reframe my view of myself by allowing me to have empathy for my younger self and therefore understand who I've become today better. But therapy can be customized to whatever is right for you and can be useful in helping with, honestly, a lot of the things that we talk about in this episode, motivation or feelings of depression, anxiety, stress, insecurity, or whatever else you might need. BetterHelp screens all their therapists to ensure that they have experience and that they're certified and licensed. And they provide customized therapy that allows you to communicate with your therapist via video, phone, and even live chat sessions. So you don't have to see anyone or speak over the phone if that's not something that you're entirely comfortable with. So you might be at the point where you're finally ready to take on therapy, which is great, but finding a therapist that you like and that you connect with can be super time consuming and expensive, which is why BetterHelp offers a more affordable alternative to in-person therapy, where you can start communicating with your therapist in less than 48 hours. And to top it all off, BetterHelp is giving I Spent a Day with viewers and listeners of the completely uncensored podcast version of the show, 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash Padilla. That's betterhelp.com slash Padilla. Now, back to the world of ex-gang members. What was it that brought you to finally get to that point? I had spent most of the 1980s incarcerated. I got out in 1988. Are you comfortable saying how you got there? I sold drugs, I stole cars, I, I did childhood stuff that, you know, even as an adult, I'm still 22, 23 doing childhood stuff. And when I got out, that was probably one of the most horrible years around for me. I was getting shot at daily. Um, they were chasing me home, shot up my mama's house. I'm going back and forth to jail. I'm trying to carry a gun, but the police come and can't carry a gun. But then the guys come shooting at me. I need to shoot back. Um, I found my life flashing before my eyes um, two, three times a week. So one particular night, I switched cars with one of my friends. So this particular night, we're in a war with schoolyard crypts. Mm. And um, as I'm coming down the street, I'm trying to catch up to everybody. The light turns red. The car pulls up next to me, and it's a schoolyard crips, and the gun is right there at my head. So I'm sitting there looking, saying, man, this is how it is. This is how I'm going to die. And I'm looking at the guy, and I know who he is. He knows who I am. But what I didn't know is that he's in the driver's seat. There's a guy next to him, yeah. and he had the gun. So it wasn't the guy I knew. It was them. And they started arguing. They said, man, that's Keith. The dude said, that's Skip. That's not. That's Tanya, baby daddy. That's Keith. And he said, it's not, and he drove off. Oh, shit. Met up with him 20 years later. We had that conversation. I said, man, why y'all didn't shoot me that night? And uh, the black Capone said, I told him that was you. (laughs) What do you think is the best way to prevent kids from finding themselves in gangs? I think the best way to prevent children from being in gangs is the relationship with the parents. One of the things that my mother had told me is she said that I don't, know how you got to be so violent. Your history is so violent. And so I had to think about it. When I was younger, my mother would tell me if somebody hits me, they hit them back. My brother hit me in the head with a fire truck one time and I told my mother and she grabbed me and said, y'all the same age, go in there and fight him back. You hit him now. You don't be going tattling. Nobody like a tattletale. I didn't learn that in the street. I learned it from my mother who never gang banged in her life. The mother and father have to work side by side and together at having a schedule for the children, whether they get picked up from school and go to um, an after-school program, the parents have to participate. So the Mm. child is always looking up and saying, yeah, my mom's right there, my dad's right there. And the parents, if they have effective communication with each other, I believe that's the best thing ever because now the child is going to learn how to communicate. The child is going to learn how to work through issues. And it's not hit somebody because they hit you or not. They're, they're going to learn how, well, how can I mediate? How can I talk to this? Because the greatest example is my parents at home working through different stuff. You know, thank God that I've learned to, I've broken the cycle. I, I have seven children um, to this day. Thank God everything is moving the way it needs to. Um, my kids are doing great. Uh, there is no... 
sign of drug addiction, no mm. sign of gang violence, no sign of any of that mm -hmm. that I was experiencing at the age of six. And I think for me, thank God that I was able to redirect my life and get the help I needed in recovery. I went to rehab. I've learned a lot about myself. I dealt with all those uh, dark skeletons in the closet and things that I had to work on, uh, which made me, f set me free. I forgave my father, later f forgave me enough to forgive my father. I went to rehab, graduated, then came to look for Father Boyle uh, from Homeboy Industries, then went back to school. I became a state certified drug counselor, and now I'm getting a taste of life. And when I come home, there's nothing but love, compassion, and understanding in my household. Everything a child needs to sustain his innocence. And I think it's very important for me personally today, you know, I have to stay clean and sober. There is no other way around that. Right. You know, there is no, maybe a little bit here, maybe a little, no, I'm an addict and I know that. If there's anyone watching who either is realizing that they're a part of the gang because they didn't have the label or if they know that they're a part of the gang, is there anything that you'd want to say to them? Maybe they're interested in, in getting out. Well, the one thing I would say to anybody who has invested time and energy and the foolishness of being a part of whatever neighborhood, community, gang, whatever you want to call it, is I would say go to school or go to work because my friends are my friends. So when they come to me and say, hey, we're about to go to the store, and I'm talking about baby killer, tiny shooter and all them, I'm going to give them $5 and say, hey, look, do, do me a favor. Give me a bag of peanut M&Ms, a Dr. Pepper and come back, but I'm going to be in the house. I got something to do. So they're still my friends. I don't ever want to say, oh, I'm not a part of that. I'm not doing that no more. What I want to do is I want to keep your friendship, but I don't want to go to jail with you. I don't want to get shot with you. Mm. I know a couple of people before who have gone to the park and say, man, I need to get put off. I don't want to be a part of this. And then, of course, everywhere they go, they're getting stomped and beat up. Mm. And it's like, so it's no need to say I'm not going to be a part of it. I have to continuously be busy. What is some of the work that you're doing to to make sure that others don't find themselves as children part of that lifestyle. I always believe in meeting them where they're at. Yeah. You know, there are only so much one can say or do before the next man or woman can receive. And be there in companionship. And just acknowledge, identify the gifts, the strengths. Because a lot of the times, you know, people say, that fool shit stinks. And then I'm gonna say to you, homie, I've been knowing that shit. <laughs> that only reinforces the resentment and the anger why I should continue to mess up. Yeah. Let's try it another way. It's about more seeing you for who you are, regardless of all this. Drugs, gangs, violence. You're still human underneath all that. I do believe the art also played a role in my recovery transformation. Yeah. Also, it gave me a sense of hope when it, Things were dark and I would draw a doodle sketch. Mm -hmm. I would create my own worlds to escape my reality. You know, those things were meaningful to me. So then in time, you know, because of the art gift and my own healing and transformation, recovery, 12 step model, everything I did, yeah. art was always at the center. So I figured, okay, now that I have recovered, have gained access, now that I've become this leader within my community, how then do I create a, a access for others? What is it about doing what you do, your work that you're doing, that brings you the most joy? Yeah. I think for me, it's a way that I make amends to my community for the day will come that I too will see and meet my creator. And I think as part of my own terrifying the community, causing trauma to my environment and family, I think that the way that I can do God's work is by being present and giving back and making amends at the same time mm -hmm. by being of service. I have saved lives that I have got different sides that were once shooting and killing each other to sit at a table, to eat together. And now for some have been eight months, some have been three years, um, but they're not killing each other anymore. That's the greatest joy. That's the greatest joy and also the greatest agony because law enforcement takes credit with their deployment of patrol, mm. their detectives, they say, yeah, we've calmed this area down. But right. no, I got the drive-by shooters at the table. The reason why they're not shooting is not because you got more patrol units or your detectives got overtime. It's because I put them at the table and paid $200 for them to eat. And now they're not killing each other no more. Mm. As much as people like me 
have worked with the young people in the community, it's like taking a bath and putting on the same dirty clothes because we put them back in the environment mm. that doesn't support the change. We put them back in society, law enforcement, judicial system that hasn't changed their perspective mm -hmm. of the children. Mm -hmm. Certain communities, these are inmates, these are suspects, these are defendants, and they have not humanized them. Working with the, the change of the mindset, but also working on the environment, but then working on the perception that people have, I think that's why this interview will be great because this can change the perception that people have on young people growing up in the community that it's not always uh, what you read about in books. Uh, you're a spring chicken. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. A uh, spring rooster. <laughs> okay, rooster. Uh, I identify as a rooster. Right, right. <laughs> a bach? Mm, I don't know what a bach is. I'm not going to... I was trying to replace letters and it oh, just didn't work oh, out. Yeah. It, it was a little too far. Oh, yeah, I got it now. <laughs> it, was, but I it was a little too far. <laughs> I got it. <laughs>